sower. Where the seed falls. The sower has a kind of generosity of spirit. Or a foolishness of spirit. Or maybe a foolish generosity. That doesn't seem to care where the seed falls, how it falls. Our father liked to think about this because he liked to think about how this is what has happened with the word of God. This is what happens to us. We see it. This is what happens to the church throughout history. There are ways in which our Lord's message, because there are saints who live who live our Lord's message, who embody the spirit of the Gospels, who love our Lord in the Eucharist. They have an influence. Grace has its influence in ways that oftentimes work beyond the way that we ourselves understand. As we turn to our Lord in the Eucharist, thinking of the parable of the sower, we can, we can come to see how our Lord is at the same time the sower, the seed, and the final fruit of the sowing. Our Lord is the one who sows the gospel into our hearts, the seeds of, the, the seeds of truth. These seeds take plant in our hearts. They bear fruit. They bear fruit, in some cases, in a very physical way, producing the grain that becomes the wheat, that becomes the bread, that becomes the bread of eternal life, our Lord. And because of this, in a mysterious way also, we all become members of the body of Christ. You, our Lord, you, St. Paul says, are the body of Christ. And individually, you are members of it. Jesus not only gives us his word, he gives us himself. He inserts himself into our lives. And he does this as a pledge of love. We're told in John's Gospel before our Lord institutes the Eucharist. At the moment when the, when the, the Last Supper is about to begin, The Holy Spirit tells us he loved those who were his own. He loved those that he was leaving in the world. And he loved them so much that he wanted to give the uttermost proof of his love to them. Our Lord is always seeking for ways for us to know that we love him, to remind us that he loves us, to know that he loves us. Our Lord is always seeking ways to enter deeper into our hearts. He's always seeking ways to show his pr- the proof of his love for us. <clears throat> and our Lord's grace, we know, it works in mysterious ways. Our Lord is showing his love for us. He's loving us to the end because we, in becoming him, we in turn are the saints. We in turn are his faithful. We're not maybe saints yet, but we're struggling to be saints. We in turn are his faithful who are the seeds in the world. are spreading the good news. 
We are sowers with him. We're spreading this good news because we realize we carry something within us. We carry a deep love within us. That we, when we were younger, we never could have dreamed of. It's a deep love that we carry within us because there's no greater love than uniting ourselves to God. We know that God is the greatest gift of all. God is the greatest good of all. Because we have our Lord within us, we also have a foretaste of heaven within us. We have a foretaste of eternal life within us. And Lord, we thank you because from time to time there are moments when we feel or we see more tangibly the effects of your grace. There are moments where we have a greater opportunity to unite ourselves in love to you, to prepare ourselves for that eternal banquet that we will one day participate in. From time to time, you give us a sign. of your love to encourage us, to help us, to carry, help us through difficult moments. You give us little rewards and we thank you for them. <clears throat> From time to time, you also show us how in being faithful to our spirit, great good can come out of it. We know that more often than not, the good that comes is good that we don't see. And we thank you, Lord, because if we probably if we saw all the good that comes as a result of you dwelling within us, we could become prideful. Though once in a while, it's not bad to see some fruit. Of course, Lord, we keep praying, we keep asking you for fruit. We keep asking you for souls. We keep asking you that you give us the energy, the commitment, the generosity, whatever it is that we need to to be sowers, to sow more seeds in more hearts, in more souls, so that we can we can start reaping a harvest, a tangible harvest. It's great to hear stories. I guess now we say stories from the old country, (laughs) stories from the previous millennium, from the previous century. But it's great to hear. I mean, it's how I was just hearing the other day in 1972, between the men and women alone in one in one in one city, about 200. 200 vocations in one year. <clears throat> they had to build 20 centers <laughs> in order to house all these people. <laughs> in four years, they had to build 20 centers. Lord, we, we ask you that this happen. We know that it needs to happen. The world needs it to happen, Lord. We need souls who are willing to sow peace in the world. A world that has become so violent. Both on the international scene and perhaps also on the domestic scene. But How much we need, Lord, sowers of peace and joy. Lord, we thank you for this pledge that you have made for us, that you have made to us. And we thank you with faith and with hope because we know that at the final judgment, right, all of our good efforts will be made known. 
And I suppose that gives us a certain amount of a fortitude, of faith. When we make sacrifices, when we offer up hours of work, when we bear with the difficulties and contradictions of life, you've given us this pledge, this pledge of your being present in our souls, of your power. You've given us this support, which supports us, it supports the whole world. You've given us the promise of salvation. <clears throat> You've shown us time and again how in a mysterious way when we are you, when we are united to your cross, when we're united to you in the Eucharist, we too are helping souls. We too are supporting the world. We are making you known and we are making you present. We are making you known. In the only way that can satisfy the hunger that others have in their hearts and in their souls. The hunger that they have for truth, for justice, for peace, for unity. St. Paul tells us Christ is our peace. Lord, we thank you for those moments, <clears throat> as we've been saying, when you've made your grace more tangible. There's an example I'm aware of, a supernumerary in France who joined the army. And so he's in the army with the typical struggles of a soldier in the army. But over time, he, he became some sort of a commander of a unit. And he ended up taking his unit of 50 men to Algeria for some training exercises. So being in Algeria, he thought, well, <clears throat> I should try to get to Mass. So he started asking around. And there were no masses in the city where they were, but there was a, he found out there was a monastery, probably a little outside of the city, maybe 15 minutes to a half an hour outside of the city. And they didn't really have, nobody had really their own vehicles. They had a bus. So he starts saying to, he, he says to somebody, I'm going to go to Mass tomorrow. What are you going to take? The bus. <laughs> I'm going to go with you. And then word starts spreading that the commander is going to Mass, so all the soldiers start saying, I'm going to Mass, I'm going to Mass, I'm going to Mass, I'm going to Mass. So they fill the bus with 50 people. Frenchmen. <laughs> right? Well, they say in France, if you practice the faith, you really practice it. Right, that at least what I remember one time coming running into this student and we were, there was kind of a group of us there, this one French student from Versailles and a bunch of other students and <clears throat> we were all there and at a Catholic university with beautiful architecture, basilica and campus. The architecture is modeled off of the buildings, 17th century buildings in Le Mans, France. And so at one point, someone says to the French student, hey, so what do you think about all the signs of Catholicism around here at this university? And he says, I am scandalized. <laughs> <laughs> He says, in France, if you are Catholic, you are really Catholic. <laughs> if you are not Catholic, you go live like a pagan. <laughs> but here, people say they're Catholics, and they live like pagans. <laughs> I am scandalized. <laughs> <clears throat> and actually, a lot of practicing Catholics do join the army in France. 
So they're on their little bus ride out to go to Mass. They get to Mass, <clears throat> and the, the commander, you know, he's always, as always, when we go to Mass somewhere, we're not quite sure what's going to happen, <laughs> right? Who, who's going to say what? And when, a, when a group of people shows up that aren't the ordinary group, so they kind of go in and they notice that the priest is kind of looking at them. His eyes are kind of big. Uh, he looked kind of surprised, bewildered a little bit. So the commander gets a little bit concerned. I hope we're not imposing. And then mass starts. And the guy starts crying. The priest starts crying during the mass. <clears throat> and so the, the commander is kind of bewildered now on what's going on here. During the Eucharist, he's especially, the priest is especially in tears. And so the priest finishes the Mass, but goes kind of very slowly through the whole Mass. It ends up being kind of a long Mass just by the way he prays it. And so the, the obvious thing that happens after Mass, people, the priest is wondering, what, what, what is this? So the soldiers start filing out. <clears throat> the commander goes up to the priest. They introduce each other. They start talking. After a little bit of small talk, the commander kind of says, you know, I, I hope that we didn't bother you by being here. And I hope that, you know, because we just kind of showed up, we didn't announce that we were coming. And I, you know, I'm sorry if, if that caused any, any problems for you. But we also noticed, I mean, I also noticed that, you know, you were kind of crying during Mass. Is everything okay? And the priest said, no, 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 everything's fine. Everything's fine. It's just... <clears throat> It's just today's, last night in my prayer, I was telling our Lord how so often I'm here, I've been here for 50 years. And so often I, when I say Mass, I say Mass alone. It's just me. And nobody comes. And I've been serving our Lord here for 50 years. And so I asked our Lord last night in the prayer, if he could tell me, if he could give me some sign to say that it's worth it, have I just been wasting my time here for 50 years? Or is it really worth it? <clears throat> and the reason I asked him is because today is the 50th anniversary of my ordination. And 50 of you showed up. <laughs> so it was a sign. Yes, it is worth it. And of course, the supernumerary was just, he was just doing the norms. He was being apostolic while he was trying to do the norms. Trying to bring people with him. And so they were all united in the Eucharist at this moment. And they all saw at this moment. They all felt, though we don't rely on feelings, but once in a while, Lord, it's not so bad. We need a little, we need some crumbs. Every once in a while, we need some crumbs. But Lord, help us to learn from these examples. Help us to draw from them in ordinary moments. Help us to realize that our, our ordinary efforts to remain united to you in the Eucharist are worthwhile, that they bear fruit. Thank you that you're with us in our homes, that you're with us in our centers, that our centers, as our Father would say, are another Bethany, a pleasant place where you reside, a pleasant place where like Martha, we can go to you. 
We can go to you when life gets busy. Martha went to you when Lazarus had died, was sick and had died, and she spoke with you about her, about her brother. And Martha, who also just happily served you without saying anything at some moments. Lord, we thank you that you're here. You're here with us. You're here so close to us, which is another sign of the uttermost love that you have for us. Because you're with us in our worries, in our sufferings, in our desires, in our joys. And we know that because you're with us and we receive you every day, we carry within us the sweet fragrance of Christ. We carry your fragrance within us. We know that because you're with us, because your seed is within us, because we feel the effects of your love, that our relationship with you, that in a, because of our relationship with you, that you bring forth within us joy, serenity, a desire for justice, peace. And because of that, we know also, Lord, and we thank you that we can sow your seed generously in the hearts of others. We can be part of a generous work, a work which sometimes is tiring, which sometimes is long, which sometimes involves difficulties. Just as plowing and sowing and weeding and reaping and threshing involves difficulties. But we know that it's worth it. It's worth to... It's worth to Build up the kingdom of God in history. It's worth it to, it's, 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 the, it's the best thing that it's worth doing. Lord, as we adore you today in the Eucharist, help us to remember this. Help us to impress in our hearts, in our minds, that we're not yet at the time for resting. Intensify in our hearts this apostolic zeal. This apostolic zeal which leads us (coughs) to not be afraid, which leads us to interior struggle, which leads us to be apostles, which leads us to be sowers, Lord, we know you are at our side. Mary, also. Mary, our mother. Help us. Help us to be Eucharistic souls. Eucharistic souls that are committed and that give all that we can to lead souls to your Son, Jesus Christ. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations that you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help to put them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.